Welcome to week four, sort of, of uh, reading the Bhagavad Gita. We are on chapter four, and this chapter is called Wisdom in Action. And in this chapter, Krishna tells Arjuna that spiritual wisdom is the highest goal that a person can have in this life. We also have Krishna explaining and describing his role, not just in the events of the Gita, but in the events, in all the events of the world. The Gita operates on several levels. It operates on the level of the macro, so big picture stuff, and it also comes down to this micro level, you know, the small, immediate individual. So, for instance, there are things in the Gita that operate on the level of individual existence, my life, your life. With with just a flip of the switch in our perception, though, those very same things can be applied to the macro, to the way the world itself is structured. The first place I want to begin is actually with um, a passage from one of Diana Morrison's introductions. Um, in this... Um, in this uh, Nil- Nilgiri Press edition, uh, the Eknath Eswaran translation of the Gita, um, besides Eknath Eswaran's uh, very long and extremely helpful um, introduction to the whole text, uh, each chapter has a little bit shorter but very, very helpful introduction from another author, Diana Morrison. I haven't really read any of her introductions um, so far in this series, but she had something to say in the introduction to this chapter that really, really resonated with me uh, on this go-around of reading the Gita. And it has to do with Krishna's role specifically as an avatar of Vishnu. And what, like, thematically, why, why that is thematically su- significant, um, what, that, what that holds for us, the readers. So, Morrison writes, Vishnu, the preserving or sustaining person of the Hindu trinity, the other two being, uh, if you're not aware, uh, Brahma, uh, the creator, and Shiva, the destroyer, that's at least the male trinity, there's also a female trinity as well. Vishnu, the preserving or sustaining person of the Hindu trinity, is not mentioned here, but Krishna is usually looked upon as an incarnation of this aspect of God. Vishnu is believed to descend and incarnate himself on earth from age to age to reestablish divine law, or dharma. Without such intervention, the entire created universe would go into decline. What Morrison is referring to is uh, one of the first verses uh, that I wanted to talk about in this chapter, and that is verses 7 through 8, where Krishna says, Whenever dharma declines and the purpose of life is forgotten, I manifest myself on earth. I am born in every age to protect the good, to destroy evil, and to reestablish dharma. So Morrison's introduction gives us a little more of the historical or cosmological context, I guess might be more accurate, Um, which if you, maybe you're aware, maybe you're not, um, about that Krishna is this, you know, kind of looked at uh, quite frequently as, a, as an avatar of another deity, that deity being Vishnu. And that Vishnu, uh, that, that Krishna, like Vishnu, has a particular role um, in the universe. Um, and that is to preserve. Preserve what? Well, with Vishnu, we're talking about preserving uh, the world, you know, the physical reality. And uh, as well as um, this divine law, Dharma, you know, the right things being done. And who are the beings that do the right things or the wrong things? Well, for the most part, I would guess you would say it's, it's us, it's human beings. But human beings have a, uh, a tendency to veer off the track. And so this concept of a deity whose principal job is to preserve things, um, I think is really interesting. 
um, for, for myself coming from, uh, you know, I was raised uh, Roman Catholic, the concept of God having something to do with the creation of the world, as well as the end of the world, that's very familiar to me. I can get down with that. You know, I can get with, um, you know, uh, the book of Genesis, there you have the creation, book of Revelation, here's how it all comes to a, a crashing halt. So there you have uh, the, the, the creating aspect of God and the destructive aspect. Of course, in uh, Christianity uh, and other monotheistic religions, um, it, it is, um, it's not personified. Uh, God is not personified as, okay, uh, this is the creator God, that's the destroyer God, and then we have this preserving God. That preserving aspect of God in, in the Hindu trinity um, is, is an aspect that, uh, like for myself, being raised um, a Catholic, that's kind of not as um, pronounced. You know, it's kind of like God creates, destroys. Um, there is actually a pretty famous line in the Proverbs, you know, the Lord giveth, or no, it's not Proverbs, it's Job, uh, the book of Job, where he says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. He doesn't mention the Lord preserving anything, um, which can strike one as maybe redundant, but actually, if you think about it, this is a really crucial element of, um, well, everyday reality. Um, we can, um, this this may be the first um, foray into what I was talking about at the beginning of this video, where everything has like a micro level and a macro level way of looking at it. Because here on the big picture, maybe the biggest picture we can imagine, we're talking about the state of the universe. We're talking about where it comes from, what it's doing, and where it's going. But we also know that, um, or we've talked about in the last couple of videos, um, particularly about uh, karma and about how um, emotions and sensations, they rise, they, have a, they follow a birth and death cycle, just like the body. Um, so the body itself comes into existence, it's preserved, you know, through things like food, sleep, shelter, we preserve it as long as we can, uh, and then it dies. At each individual moment of, of our life, sensations come up, they come out of, uh, they're, they're stimulated by something in the environment, or they're stimulated by a thought we have, or maybe they just come out of nowhere, but they, they have a rising and a falling. They have a, a birth and a death. But what we haven't really talked about is their preservation. So we're a little abstract here. Let's, let's bring it down to earth. Suppose I have a thought. Uh, somebody says something uh, that I don't like. Somebody says something nasty to me. Um, I have a thought uh, that my feelings are hurt. Uh, maybe I have another thought that um, maybe they say something nasty about me and I think something nasty about them. Um, I could also struggle maybe with, uh, you know, maybe if they said I'm, uh, uh, I don't know, a bad driver, or maybe they say uh, you're a bad student, bad worker, whatever. Maybe I might start thinking, well, is that true? Like, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I have this little debate going on in my head. And then um, the phone rings, and I answer it. It's a friend. I I talk to them about something completely unrelated. Or maybe I'm listening to the radio, and my favorite song comes on. I get distracted. And 15 20 minutes go by, I've completely forgotten about this, this sensation that maybe was very powerful at first. But what if, what if the radio comes on, or I get that phone call from my friend, and I, I hang on to that feeling, I hang on to that thought. You know, gosh, that person was, they were so nasty. Why did they say that to me? Um, you know, I should say something nasty to them the next time I see them. I should come up with a good comeback next time. Um, what I'm doing in that moment is I'm preserving it. So I'm, I am playing a little bit of a role in how I feel. I kind of choose, um, at least to ex an extent, how much I want to participate with the constant chaos that goes on up here. Um, in probably 90% of the time, it's... 
uh, just it's just on autopilot. There's just uh, all kinds of thoughts going on. If I if I engaged with every thought that I had, I don't I wouldn't get anything done. But when I engage with those thoughts that hit me somewhere, you know, here, I uh, can't see, but somewhere in my uh, solar plexus, you know, or somewhere in my in my heart, you know, um, those are the big ones or my root chakra, you know, any anything having to do with like, you know, the way I feel about myself, how I relate to other people, um, how secure I feel, uh, how safe I feel, how loved I feel. Somebody tries to take that away from me. Um, I'm going to kind of obsess over it. And a lot of people, I think, I think most people are probably like that before we start embarking on some kind of um, spiritual path or some kind of path where we start to kind of challenge that that habitual reaction to the outside world not acting the way we would like it to. But we preserve those thoughts and those feelings uh, by engaging with them. That's the negative side. Now, the positive side is when I have, um, when I'm listening to a tape, uh, maybe I'm listening to a Ram Das tape, or I'm listening to a tape by uh, a Swami talking about the Bhagavad Gita, or I'm listening to um, someone talk about Swabi, uh, Swami Vivekananda. Um, you know, uh, I'm listening to someone tell a, a story about him and Ramakrishna, uh, some conversation they had. And it's uh, something I've never heard before, and it's really resonating with me, and I, and I love listening to it. Um, or I'm doing a, a mantra. You know, maybe I'm sitting in front of the, uh, the Kali statue that I have, and I'm doing a, a Kali mantra. If I sit there for like maybe 20 minutes, and I'm just like, I'm absolutely just in bliss, you know, with Kali. Um, I can... I can preserve that uh, thought, those um, thoughts, those feelings, those sensations. I can take those, and ideally I should be taking those. After I put the beads down, after I put the statue back where it, it, where it belongs, um, after I turn the, take the headphones off and turn the tape off, grab my car keys and start heading to work, I should be taking that experience, that connection with, with the divine on the road. Doesn't always happen. I'll be completely honest. It doesn't always come with me. Sometimes I forget. When, when I go through a phase, maybe you've gone through something like this as well, when I go through a phase where kind of day after day for maybe a week, uh, maybe longer, maybe a month, maybe years, where I'm habitually, I'm routinely, routinely forgetting. Puja in the morning is done, not doing it anymore. The beads are covered in dust. The statue is, who knows where it is? Where did I put it last? Can't remember. The tapes, I'm not listening to tapes anymore. I'm listening to... Uh, I don't know, Nine Inch Nails, uh, Rage Against the Machine, uh, you know, angry, aggressive, negative. I need something or someone to step in. Because of my own accord, I'm kind of in kind of in the, um, I'm in a fog. I'm in a fog. I need a light to shine through. I need a little bit of help. What I'm, what I'm coming to is that this passage can be looked at in a couple of ways. We can look at it as Dharma declining in the world. Or we can look at it as Dharma declining in my own life. Okay, so when Dharma declines in my life, when I start to veer off the right track, 
when I'm no longer practicing my dharma, uh, when I'm no longer uh, spending time with God, when I'm no longer um, going to going to the divine uh, um, for for that feeling of connection, and I'm instead looking for it in things that are transitory and usually not very good for me. Uh, physically sometimes and spiritually as well, not very good for me. You could say that Dharma is declining. My Dharma is declining. My practice of Dharma is declining. My purpose of life is forgotten. You know, when you hear the Gita, when you hear the truth, when you hear something, some kind of message um, about the way it all really is, and then you start to kind of get caught up in other things, you start to forget. And a lot of times we don't always realize that we've, we've forgotten. And so this, this passage pr produces an image for me of something or somebody kind of swooping in to the rescue. Um, whether that's on the level of the whole world, a whole culture. Um, I would say that on the whole, uh, the world right now, I'd say probably uh, Dharma's declining. I don't think I'm the first one to make that observation. Um, I mean, we are, if you're into this sort of thing, we are in the, the Kali Yuga, um, where the decline of Dharma is kind of part of the whole, uh, it's kind of part of the package. But I like to focus on the Gita's message to me as an individual um, and how I relate to others, how I relate to the world. Um, that was the way I was taught to read it, um, which was to, to read it almost as a direct message to me, almost as if I'm kind of putting myself in Arjuna's shoes uh, and sitting at the feet of God and listening to the truth. This is... Um, this is why the Gita is not a book that you just read once. This is a book that people read many, many times uh, in their life uh, because there is this understanding that these truths are very easy to forget because most of us are not fully realized beings. Uh, most of us are still living very much in the world uh, and the world is full of lots of shiny, fast-moving, loud attractive things uh, that make um, for very easy distractions, very easy to get distracted and, and veer off the path. And that happens time and time again. This is, um, this is not just about, I think I've used this metaphor previously, if I haven't. Um, this, the way that I look at meditation is that it is not the, 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 the goal isn't to try and stop my mind. It's to practice coming back to the breath or coming back to whatever the object is that I have chosen to focus on. Um, so for me, I don't do as much that kind of meditation. I do more, um, I guess you would call bhakti kind of stuff. Um, so for me, it's coming back to the mantra or coming back to the the image that I'm, you know, meditating in front of, the statue or the picture. My mind is going to wander. That's a certainty. I'm a human being. That's what my mind is going to do. But what I can do is through practice, I can get better at coming back to whatever it is that I'm trying to redirect my focus to. And I apply that same principle to, to like, behavior, to dharma, uh, to the way that I conduct myself in the world. It's not a matter of making sure that I'm perfect every day. It's, it's not if, but when I mess up, not if, but when I veer off the track, I'm able to come back to it. So how does uh, the divine manifest itself um, on earth? Well, surface level of this passage is it's going on right here. It's going on with Krishna manifesting himself um, and, and uh, making himself available to, to Arjuna as his advisor.
on the level of, you know, oneself as a reader of this text, the way that I think about this is I try to look at, I try to look for people in my life or things in my life who are carrying the message of the divine, whether they realize it or not. Uh, because I think that God speaks through people. Um, I think that uh, I think that you can find the kinds of truths that Krishna is trying to point out to Arjuna pretty much wherever you look, if you look. That's kind of the catch. We've got to participate a little bit in this process. See, the divine can manifest itself. Spirits can manifest itself. But I have to avail myself of that help. And that's what Arjuna does. And that's why I think I love the opening of the Gita so much when Arjuna falls prostrate before Krishna and, and begs him, please help me. I am totally lost, dude. I need your help. And all he has to do is ask. And what he gets is this absolute ocean of spiritual wisdom and compassion. And I find that that's kind of, that's kind of my experience um, a lot of times. Almost always, almost usually when I have been at a very low point, I find that this happens. Like I think of, um, I think of the prodigal son story. So the, the parable of the prodigal son, right? The kid goes off. He um, he disgraces his family. He he disowns his family rather, and um, it doesn't really work out too well. But his father, who represents God in the parable, is so compassionate that when he sees his son in the distance, realizing that he failed and he's coming home, and he's all dirty. But the father recognizes him. He doesn't wait for the son to get to the doorstep of the house. The father runs to meet the son. He can't wait. He's so excited. And the father, of course, represents God because God doesn't have anything to lose, right? As a human being, part of me is always thinking, I have something to lose. So like if somebody disowned me, you know, and then uh, spent all my money on, you know, whatever he spent his money on um, and then comes back... If I'm not still angry, I will probably still be a little bit distrustful, right? Because I'm a human being. I've still got stuff to lose. But the divine doesn't have anything to lose because uh, it is everything, right? So it has uh, the freedom to run up and meet us. You know, so no matter how many times we veer off the path, no matter how many times we squander our grace, our gifts that we get, you know, the, the peace of minds that we might experience at certain stages on the path. Um, the divine God, Brahman, Krishna, whatever you want to call it, is not just always there to meet us, but it it's there with the open arms, right? No holds barred, no strings attached. Um, and sometimes that's, I think, one of the hardest things to accept. Um, I think that's the hardest, one of the hardest things to really, really trust, um, but so important. So the manifesting myself, when I, when I look at that, I think about, I think about one of my central problems that I think maybe a lot of people have as well, is we want a big fireworks show, right? See, I don't get Krishna coming down and telling me what I want to uh, what I have to do. If I'm having some kind of dilemma, you know, I can read the Gita, I can pray, I can chant, sing, uh, whatever, uh, talk to uh, friends of mine who are walking this path, all that sort of stuff. The big blue guy is not going to come into my bedroom. Uh, at least it hasn't happened so far. Who knows what the future holds? But the blue guy uh, with the flutes and and the and the you know the the beautiful smile and the chariot, 
so far, he has not uh, come down and stood in front of me and said, okay, Matt, here's what you have to do, step-by-step instructions. That's just, I don't think that's how it works. So uh, what I have to do is I have to look for my Krishnas in the people in my life. Um, You know, besides reading the Gita, besides listening to Swamis talk about uh, these truths, I also have um, the blessing of being around other people, you know, the Sangha, right? Um, Which I can find wherever I'm around people who are walking some kind of spiritual path. They don't have to read the Gita necessarily. In fact, most of my friends have never even heard of the Gita. They have no idea what it is. And yet, talking to them quite often, uh, they're giving me the same kind of messages that Krishna gives Arjuna in this book. But I have to be attuned to that. I have to participate a little bit. I have to, uh, I have to loosen up a little bit. I need to get this archetype out of my head of, well, if the big blue guy doesn't come in front of me or I don't get a burning bush, then I can't trust it. Well, if that's the way I'm going to be, then I'm going to be waiting a very, very long time to get any guidance uh, on the spiritual path. So I have to I have to not fight so much the human ar- incarnation, right? So I'm incarnated as a human. It is what it is. Here I am. One of the uh, conditions of that, um, or one of the blessings of that, again, depending on your perspective, is... I've got to rely on other people who are walking these kind of paths uh, for, you know, guidance and support. So the manifesting myself on earth part of this passage, well, uh, just look around you is the way that I look at it. I try to look for uh, people in my life or things in my life that I can get some kind of guidance from, some kind of reminder that can help me get back on the path of Dharma. The second part of this passage where he says, I am born in every age to protect the good, to destroy evil, and reestablish Dharma. We talk quite a lot about the reestablishing Dharma part, but the protecting the good and destroying the evil. Again, a lot of ways we can look at that. You can think about it like protecting good people uh, and destroying evil people. That's one way of looking at it. Um, one of the other ways that, uh, that you could look at it is, again, taking it to the level of the individual, um, protecting the good within me and destroying the evil within me. Cause I mean, I don't know about you, but I've got, I've got some not so great qualities and I've got some okay qualities. I've got a pretty normal mix of virtues and vices, I think. Right? And the spiritual path is trying to accentuate those virtues and kind of de-escalate those, those vices as best we can, you know, without deluding ourselves into thinking we'll become perfect, um, but doing our best. So for me, like if I'm, if I'm coming out of like a fog of doubt or a struggle, um, some kind of low point in my life. One of the things that I think is so important for me to do in those moments and what is so difficult to do, um, even though it's so helpful, it's very difficult to do a lot of times, is to try and look for some positive things, you know, whether about myself or about my life. Um, can sound kind of cliche, but, you know, it's. I think the reason it's difficult is precisely what makes it um, worthwhile to do. When we get caught up in moments or, or f- sometimes long periods of time where uh, we're doubting or we're struggling with some particular uh, samskara that we just can't shake, uh, some particular adharmic behavior, meaning not dharmic behavior that we're trying to, that we're wrestling with, it can be very hard to, to take the focus off of, of that and think about something that isn't so, so negative. 
what this this phenomenon that we're discussing, this divine descent, um, really comes down to, is the purpose of it is to remind me, or remind you, or remind Arjuna of what I already know. Right? I think I said a couple videos ago that Arjuna already knows all the stuff Krishna is going to tell him, and yet at the same time he doesn't know. Right? Well. It's, he's forgotten it because that's what happens when we fall down that scale, that kind of process of getting caught up in um, the, the wrong perspective or the unhelpful perspective. We forget things that maybe we've known for a very long time. Even things that are kind of essential to whatever we believe in, as is the case with Arjuna. However I find the divine to manifest itself in my life, wherever I look for that, wherever I can find that, whether it's in a text or another person or uh, a ritual, um, puja, some kind of connection with something outside of myself, wherever I find that, when I look for it, what I need to understand is that what's supposed to be happening is I'm supposed to be looking for something in here that has been here the whole time and isn't going anywhere, and is really the purpose of this life. And what is that? Of course, we have to go back to the big S self, the Atman, uh, the thing that doesn't die, the thing that is the whole purpose of all this other drama. Next time that we meet, uh, we'll talk about this, this highest goal that Krishna talks about from which this title's chapter is derived uh, wisdom in action where spiritual wisdom is the highest goal a person can have in this life what is that spiritual wisdom and why is it the highest goal we can have and we'll talk about that next time because it'll kind of lead off where we're ending here which is mentioning the self the atman so they're going to have something to do with one another if you haven't already guessed the highest goal is going to have something to do with the highest kind of knowledge someone can have about the uh, highest thing that there is. Because, of course, the Atman, the big self, of course, is not just me. It's not Matthew. It's not insert your name here. Um, it's what we've been talking about for the last uh, little, uh, little half hour or so which is the divine, which is God. So hope you join me for that. Hope you enjoyed this one. Um, hope to see you real soon.